So good afternoon, everybody, um, and good afternoon to our remote viewers as well. Uh, welcome to the Dream CPAR weekly seminar. Uh, we've been off for a couple weeks, but we're back. Um, so today it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Julie Adams, um, who will be discussing her recent work on adaptive human robot teaming. Uh, professor Adams is currently a professor of CS um, and the Associate Director of Deployed Systems and Policy uh, in the Collaborative and Intelligent Systems Institute at um, Oregon State University. Uh, she's actually worked in the area of human-machine teaming for over 25 years. Uh, she's developed manned civilian and military air aircraft at Honeywell, um, commercial, consumer, and industrial systems work uh, at Eastman Kodak um, before founding the Human Machine Teaming Laboratory, uh, originally at Vanderbilt University, um, and, and has since moved to, to OSU. Um, she's also a recipient of the NSF Career Award, um, and her work has been featured in, in a number of places, National Geographic and, and BBC Online. Uh, so please welcome Julie Adams. Thank you. Oh, wait, oh, I have this one on. Yeah, I didn't want to start a squeal with the mi competing microphones. So um, I call this talk the, the road to adaptive robot teammates because we don't have all the solutions yet, as you will see as we go through this. Um, as I've talked to many of you today, you're working on different components and your advisors probably have a vision about how these things are all going to come together. And in fact, this is a vision that started over 10 years ago and we're starting to see it come together now. Um, so the first thing I want to do is always ground people in what I mean by human machine teaming. For me, human machine teaming is how we bring uh, robots or complex machines together with humans so that as a team, they are able to do more than the humans could do alone. Um, and so I'm not necessarily looking to create humanoid robots to do everything we do. Um, in fact, in most of the domains I work in, I really don't want a humanoid robot, at least as, as human as we are, um, because I want the robot to be able to do tasks that are important tasks that actually help the humans. And I'm going to talk primarily about two different types of human interaction paradigms. So for some of you today, I talked about um, some work by Gene Schultz and Alan Schultz and Mike Schultz, or Alan Schultz and Mike Goodrich um, and about how they defined uh, different human robot teaming paradigms. And I'm going to talk primarily about two. One is going to be the peer-based interaction paradigm, and the other is going to be a supervisory interaction paradigm. So when I first went to Vanderbilt, I started working in complex um, first response, so chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive device events. And I chose that particular domain because I've always worked in multi-robot systems. Uh, we had the multi-robot project back in the 90s at the Grasp Lab that Regina was the PI on, and that was the project that I was on as a PhD student. Um, so I started my career doing that, and that's what I wanted to do when I came back to academia. So Rather than just looking at search and rescue, which is often lots of people to one robot, I wanted to do one person or a small number of humans to a number of robots. And so this particular paradigm creates that. Um, so we spent a lot of time working in this area, and I'm going to focus on uh, things like the hazmat and uh, EMS unmanned vehicle specialist. These are individuals who are in the warm zone. They're supervising teams of robots, working potentially with EMS personnel. And then you've got, in the hot zone, the contaminated area, you could have teams that are strictly robots, you could have strictly human teams, but you could also have these peer-based teams. And I'm going to come back to this kind of individual here. The screen feels funny. Um, it feels like somebody sprayed something on it. Um, it's sticky. Um, but I'm going to come back to this kind of uh, scenario here where the first responder is wearing this level three personal protective gear, um, which means that they have all kinds of, they're, they're basically zipped in. If you've ever gone scuba diving, they're wearing the same sort of breathing device. They're wearing a tank on their back. And if you are in Nashville, um, where it's often you know, 90 degrees and 80% humidity, you have a very short time span that you can be in this level gear and still be alive and do your, t do your job. So um, one of the sets of data that I'm going to talk about is really from the peer-based um, interaction spectrum. And then our more recent work is on uh, the supervisory control. And this is a DARPA project through NASA. So um, the thinking about the Mars rover control room is an excellent paradigm for this. And the interesting things here that make this very challenging is the fact that the Mars day, I'm sure you, all of you have heard this about uh, at various times, is 24 hours and 40 minutes, which means that your work shift is constantly shifting. So from a human performance perspective, you're constantly shifting your sleep schedule in order to maintain and align with the Martian day. And the communications, you've got a 
minute delay one way from, from the control room to the robot on Mars. So in the evening, they're downloading the information from the robots. And then overnight, the Martian night, they're planning what they want the robots to do the next day. And then in the morning, they're uploading that so that during the, during the Martian afternoon, the robots are executing those things. Um, so this is, you might think, well, that's not really the same sort of paradigm. There's not the same level of stress and fatigue. But in fact, there is a high level of stress. Because you're talking about having to create a plan that if you don't plan it correctly, you don't get to try it again for another 24, hour, or 24 hours, approximately. Now, at the time that this all started, remember, the Mars rovers had a set lifetime. The Mars rovers has exceptionally exceeded that expected lifetime. And so there's a little less stress now because you're like, OK, well, we have more time to do these things. But originally, you had a mission plan that you needed to execute. So what is our motivation? We have these human team members that work in these high stress environments that really kind of tax the way that you think about things. Um, the analogy I like to use is think about the last time you pulled an all-nighter and what your cognitive capabilities were like the next day. You had fatigue. If you were pulling an all-nighter, it was probably because you had some deadline, so you were under stress. Okay, so this all has an impact on how you perform as a human. And so we think about those kinds of things. We also think about the personal protective gear. Because when smartphones, I put my smartphone away. Can I borrow this for one moment, please? So when these came out, everyone's like, oh, well, you know, first responders can just use their smartphone to interact with the robot because we don't want to use a computer anymore. And they're not going to walk around carrying a computer. Well, if you have on that personal protective gear, it's not going to work with the touch screen, right? You just don't have the capability to do that. So that really puts a limitation on how we can do interactions between the humans and the robots. Um, and then we're talking about trying to do longer duration interactions. A lot of the research in human-robot interactions really focused on short dura duration interactions and tasks. But we want to be able to do things over a longer period of time. If you think about something like 9-11, that response went over a course of days and weeks. Um, so we want to be able to have these systems function over that period of time. And for our robot team members, they have to be able to understand what the human's doing in order to change how they're going to interact with that human. If we have some human that is triaging a victim that requires immediate care, then that human needs to be paying attention to what they're doing. And the robot can't interrupt them. How often do we see robots interrupting uh, because they aren't cognizant, really, of what's going on and what the human is doing. They don't have the same capabilities. Um, so we want to kind of use some assessments, automatic assessments, in order to augment that performance. And one of the biggest things is I actually got this feedback on, a, on an NRI review. Um, we submitted a proposal related to this. And you know, we want the robot to do something that's helping the team. If we're talking about the first response scenario, um, the robot could be over in that corner looking at a victim, and I could be over here working on a victim. And the feedback I got was, well, why aren't you using a Kinect sensor on the robot to find out what the human is doing? OK, outdoor environment, Ken's shaking his head. Outdoor environment, Kinect's not going to work. If the robot's over there and the robot needs to be doing something that actually is helping the team, then the robot can't be sitting next to the human watching the, the human. First responders don't have the kind of money to just have robots. The robots have to do something useful in order to be used in the future. All right, so that's kind of our motivation originally. And where we started was looking at what are all the factors that affect human performance. There are, in fact, over 500 different factors that impact your, your performance. And we classified them by task type. I'm only kind of giving you some high-level information here about how the tasks impact your performance, wrong key. Uh, we have the physical environment, so the personal protective gear, the temperatures, uh, the air quality. You have your team structure. Um, so this is a big aspect that we're looking at in our human swarm interaction research that I'm not going to talk about today. And then, why are my keys not working? We have internal stressors. Um, so things like the fatigue and stress that I was talking about. And what I'm going to focus on today is workload. Um, and you're probably saying, well, what do you mean by workload? Lots of people have uh, different definitions. So oftentimes in the human factors world, we talk about cognitive workload, and we talk about the overload situation. So this is a classic diagram out of Wickens et al., um, which is a classic human factors book. And on your y-axis, you have the resources that the human is applying to the particular task. And on the x-axis, you have the resources that are being demanded by that task. 
And this line here is the maximum level of resources you as an individual have to apply to that particular task. Well, we all have a different level, and that level actually changes for each of us on a different day and at different times of the day. Um, so initially, when we start out, we're not applying a lot of, um, a lot of demand. You know, we're not having to provide a lot of interaction in order to meet the requirements of the task, and the task is performing well. But at some point, as the task starts to degrade, and we're having to put more resources into managing that task, we're going to hit our maximum level. And when we do that, the performance of the task starts to go down. So when we're on this side, we have reserve capacity, meaning we've got more that we can give to the task in order to maintain the performance of the task. When we're on the right, right side, um, we are in the overload situation, meaning we've reached our maximum of what we can provide, and we still aren't able to manage uh, maintaining that task performance. And so this is the classic thing that people think about when they talk about an overload situation. Now, that's great, except for the fact that underload can be almost as bad as overload. Um, anybody ever be a life, has anybody ever, ever been a lifeguard besides me? Okay, so you probably all swam. Um, so think about being a lifeguard and sitting up in that chair for a long period of time. It's a vigilance task, okay? And you've probably noticed that the lifeguards rotate. Well, why? In order to keep them alert and make sure they maintain their vigilance. Okay, because they end up in this underload condition, they get bored, their vigilance level decreases, and they get what we call out of the loop when we talk about technology. So I'm not talking about trust. There were a couple people I talked to earlier about trust, so that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about maintaining your knowledge of what's going on in the system. And actually, underload is just as bad. And so this is a graph I created. Um, so it's based on, on Wiccans et al. And again, we have the same x and y axis, axes, um, but we have a high level of autonomy in the system. And so the task is being performed at a very high level. And we have an even lower level of resources being demanded from us. In fact, we maybe do something else. We may be texting on our phone. We may be talking on our phone. We could be doing any other task. And our primary task is this task, but we're not paying attention to it. And then what happens is the performance starts to degrade and we don't notice, okay? By the time we notice, performance has degraded significantly and we have to work much harder to try to bring that performance back up. So what happens is we reach that maximum level higher and in fact, that crossover point moves, shifts to the left. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Shifts to the left. Um, so we actually have worse performance. So the question is, you know, how can you deal with these overload and underload situations? And in this case, I'm talking about cognitive workload. However, we want to talk about workload in a broader context. So we talk about overall workload, which includes the cognitive aspects. And in most cases, we also in human factors talk about auditory, which is your listening, visual, your ability to read or focus on various things and direct your visual attention. Speech, your ability to talk and listen and read at the same time. If you can read and talk at the same time about two different things, I'm very impressed. Um, and then the motor and tactile. And these are pretty typical decompositions. Um, we talked, I've talked a lot with people today about human modeling. And most of the modeling that I've been talking to people about here today is really based on kinematics and muscular types of things. Um, we actually model the cognitive aspects. And we use a tool, a tool called Imprint Pro, which was developed by the Army. And uh, what it does is it actually breaks workload down into these components, and then they develop empirical models of these particular elements that you can use to do modeling of your tasks. Now, this is great. And one of the reasons that this is important to me is go back to that scenario I was talking about earlier, where that EMS person is triaging that immediate care victim. And so most likely they've got a high cognitive load as they try to figure out what treatments they need to provide. They've got a high visual load because they're kind of scanning the victim and making sure that they're doing the right things. And then they may have um, a high physical load. And I forgot to go forward one slide. Uh, I better, I, let me back up for a minute, sorry. I forgot that I was gonna do the supervisory first. So this kind of thing, this paradigm here, works very well in the supervisory case, where you've got a control room, people are sitting at computers, they're doing you know, fine motor movements, they're doing some tactile things. 
Um, but when we start going to our first responders, then there's much more than just the motor and tactile that really goes into the physical. And so that's why we group those two into physical and we add some elements. So we go back to that first response scenario that I was just talking about. The first responders doing the cognitive, the visual, and the physical aspects are actually working on the victim. I, as the robot, recognize that this individual has high overload, but I need to communicate something to that individual. If I would typically use an auditory channel, I probably shouldn't do that because I shouldn't interrupt them while they're taking care of this immediate care victim. Um, even though auditory is underloaded at this time, they're in an overload state due to these other factors, right? So if I understand what these factors are, I can understand how I might communicate with that individual. Perhaps if it's not something that needs to be immediately communicated, it can be delayed, I can text it to them for later. Yes, Ravina. We're going to get there. That's what we're talking about most of the talk. Um, so uh, all of these things you know, play into how you make decisions to adapt your interactions or even reallocate tasks. So if we have a new task that comes in, uh, perhaps another immediate care victim has been identified, then I can't assign it to this person here because they're overloaded in general. Um, so I can identify another team member to allocate that task to and do that automatically and relieve the human of having to deal with that particular task on top of the triaging task. So trying to get my buttons to work here. This is the, uh, I'm going to go over kind of our system architecture for the Envision system. So we have our workload metrics coming in. So Rosina, these are primarily, uh, a lot of them are cognitive based, but you'll see that they go across the different factors in a moment. And what we want is we want an activity recognition system. We don't have that yet. Right now we are working with the fact that we know what the tasks are because we've been doing structured human studies. Um, and we have our workload models, which are from the Imprint Pro that are representing um, in, in the first study for the peer-based, it was just an overload and a normal load situation. For our supervisory study, it's underload, normal load, and hot overload. Um, and these models are showing you know, the individual tasks as well as the uh, conditions and how, they, how we expect them to come out um, in the actual scenario. We want to feed that information as well as the metrics into our algorithm that then gives us a performance prediction. With that performance prediction, yep. Hold that thought. Yes. Yeah. Well, not necessarily on the model, but I'm going to talk about the metrics. We'll talk more. Hold on. Okay. So we have this information. From there, we can start doing our adaptations, okay? So ICIFR is a coalition formation system that we've developed over time um, that will automatically allocate tasks. Um, and then we can also use the workload estimates and the predicted performance to modify the interaction. So there's two things that we could be modifying. And if we are trying to reallocate the tasks, then we can reallocate them to other team, team members, be they human or robot. Um, and if we're looking at changing the interactions, why are my buttons not working? Um, then we need to make sure that the robots know what's going on as well as applying that to the interaction with the human. And of course, if new tasks come in, we can have them feed in this way. So the green here means that uh, these are things that we've been working on or they're, they're mostly solved. The orange are things that we still need to do. So the modeling, Regina, was uh, mostly done by my student Caroline, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, she graduated already. And then the, uh, the, the work here as well as um, the orange stuff is being done by my current student, Jameson. So I'm going to first next talk about the model. OK, so what raised the questions were, that we have these existing models of cognitive interaction, for example, cognitive functions, as well as um, fatigue and stressors of that nature. And they're well known in domains such as air traffic control, cockpits for pilots, and 
um, nuclear power plant control rooms. And these are much more constrained environments, right, than the environments we want to deal with. So the big question for Caroline's work was, can we take these models and functions and apply them to human-robot interaction? And at that time that we started it, we didn't know. So our questions were, do the existing functions apply to human-robot teaming? And then what human performance metric trends exist? And we did these evaluations, all the evaluations I'm talking about uh, for the peer-based interaction. In this study, we had human-human teams and we had human-robot teams. Um, but I'm only really going to talk about the human robot today. Um, and then what metrics are sensitive, reliable, and usable for our domains? And in this case, we were talking about the first response domain, wearing the protective gear um, for, the, for the predominant amount of work. So here are some more pictures of what you're looking at. You can see that they've got additional headgear on. Why is this important? Going to the point of what metrics can you use? So we want objective metrics. We don't want subjective metrics um, because they're difficult to apply in these kinds of circumstances. We want to have sensors that we can put on the individuals. Well, if you're wearing this kind of gear, it's difficult to wear a lot of the sensors. Um, so we were trying to understand what sensors could we use and what, how do they map to uh, the particular aspects of workload. So what you see here is just a subset of the long list of metrics that you could use. Everything above this line is an objective metric. And these two, a NASA task load index and our in-situ ratings are subjective. Um, and you can see for each of these metrics, we have a correlation to workload. And we also have a correlation to either the, in some cases, multiple things, but cognitive, auditory, speech, visual, and physical. And we want to have multiple metrics for each one of these five aspects here. So you can see a lot of these things do map to cognitive. However, for example, heart rate is very tied to physical activity. So you have some situations where heart rate really is not going to be indicative of cognitive load. It's going to be more indicative of physical workload. So you have to have that task understanding. Um, and then the other issue here, so I've got EEG and FNIRS there. Has anybody tried to work with EEG and FNIRS? Rosina has. You know, uh, so the problem for us, even in the supervisory situation, you're talking about operators working for long periods of time, you get signal noise from the EEG. They really aren't useful over a long period of time. They aren't even feasible for our first responders. Similarly for FNIRs, um, right now we actually just had a conversation uh, with a vendor about FNIRs because we were thinking about the possibility of using it. And while it's great, it goes on the forehead um, that's not going to be great for our first responders. You still have to be attached to a big device. And really all they're getting is some prefrontal cortex so knowledge. This is very interesting, but can you please uh, tell us which are in particular cognitive? Because I would argue that a lot of these things are physiological and physical they are, yeah. posture sway. And so posture sway is purely physical. So yeah. these right here marked in gray are cognitive, right? So, so respiration rate is not cognitive. Posture magnitude and posture sway are not. Sorry, I should have said the gray ones. Skin temperature does correlate to cognitive. So this is in the, in the, the physiological literature, yes. Um, but see, skin temperature decreases. If skin temperature goes up, it means something else. So you've got to have these correlations to the proper change, right? The other thing, too, is, you know, I was talking about heart rate. Really, the reliable metric here is heart rate variability for cognitive, right? Um, now, the problem with heart rate variability, and you see this a lot in the literature, is that uh, for things like the Fitbot and any of the physical monitors that you have, uh, uh, physical activity monitors, they give you a moving average. They don't give you the actual heart rate variability independent data, which is what you have to have in order to really use heart rate variability to detect these things. And in addition to that, it's known from the literature with heart rate variability that you have to have a 30-second epoch of heart rate variability data in order to actually see workload changes. So you've got to have these long periods of time that you're getting that change. Now, for our domain, um, I already talked about EEG and FNIR as not being usable. Practically, in these uh, first responders, you don't, you don't have all these. 
That's what I'm talking about right now. Okay. So um, EEG and FNIRs we can't use. Even for our supervisory situation in a control room, they're not usable over the longer period of time. They're not usable for different reasons. Eye tracking, anybody try to use eye tracking? Yes. Does not work if you don't have a defined screen, right? And so I've spent the last five years talking to eye tracking companies about the fact that we really, I mean, these work really well in the literature for identifying cognitive workload, right? They work fantastically, but we can't take them out in the world, right? They've used them in the car. They've used them in the car, but the difference there is that you have a defined area that you're looking, right? You are sitting there. You're sitting, you're not moving, and you think about driving, right? In most circumstances where you're driving, the environment is pretty consistent. Right? It's not like going into a building that's just blown up and you've got different kinds of debris piles because you've got different types of buildings. So that's why it's red. It doesn't work. Okay. So another really nice thing from the literature are all these speech-based metrics. But you know what? There's no algorithms out there yet. These are orange because we're working with our collaborator, Matthias Schotz, who's an expert in natural language, because he, his group is actually developing these algorithms for us. Because otherwise, you have to use coding. And if any of you have ever done video coding, you know that it takes forever. And it's very boring. Yeah, because like, yeah, it takes way too long. Um, and so you could do the same thing for speech. But again, it's really problematic. It's not real time. It's not real time, right. Exactly. So I mean, for, for Caroline's study, we were really just kind of focusing on, can we use these metrics? So she actually tried to do some coding of the, of the speech, and it just was taking too long. And I was just like, forget it. We have all the speech, but we're not going to do it. So these are orange, because um, I actually just pinged Jameson yesterday to say, have you talked to Matthias lately to find out where this algorithm is for us? Um, we gave them a whole bunch of uh, speech data from our subject, uh, subjects. Um, for them to work on the algorithm. So we really want to get this. Now, this does make sense in our domain because the first responders are wearing a microphone. Most of the time, they are wearing a bone microphone. Um, and if you aren't familiar with bone microphones, they work on a different signal than a standard audio microphone. Um, so right now, what we're working on is a standard audio microphone. Um, and hopefully, we're going to get it so that it works on the bone microphone. The bone microphone takes out all the ambient noise, noise in the environment, so you get a much cleaner signal. But it's a harder signal to interpret uh, for the natural language processing. So what we're looking at here are things like the speech rate, um, filler, ut filler ut utterances. I just gave you one when I said ah, um, things like that. We also look at secondary tasks. Now, if you've ever used secondary task, a lot of times you want to use something like a math problem or a memory problem, which was what we used in Caroline's work. And that's great, except that it's not realistic. So in her final study, we actually used kind of a standard um, communication task that would occur in the first response scenario of you have to be listening to messages specific to your team. Um, and then you have to respond to those messages. So that's a really nice secondary task as well. OK, hang on a minute. Where, oh, wait, it's going to skip that slide because I hit it. OK. So this is based on Caroline's results. So like I said, she did three studies. All of them were first response based. Uh, all of them had uh, a high workload condition and a low workload, like a regular load condition. She ran human, human, and human, uh, human robot teams. They did the exact same things uh, in the three different studies. And all of the scenarios were first response scenarios. And her longer um, study, her middle study, was 45 minutes. Um, the other studies were 15 minutes with the same workload levels, or different workload levels, sorry, but the same 15 minutes for each task so that you had a higher task density. And based on this, um, we can see what are the recommendations. And a lot of this is based on our first responder scenario. 
Um, so you can see here that heart rate and respiration rate aren't really recommended. They're red because of the physical activity. Um, so we're talking about responders that are very physical, so that's not going to be a good metric for us. The heart rate variability is green, so it's a very usable metric. And we use the BioPack BioHarness, um, which can communicate in real time to an off-board computing system, or a robot in this case. Um, what we're working on right now is being able to process that in real time, so they have a piece of software that you can use with it. Um, they usually use it for post-processing, and so we're working with them to have it work in real time right now. Um, of course, one of the issues for us, the first study we did, we did in a medical center in the simulation lab because we use robotic mannequins, and you couldn't do communication from the bioharness to another device because there's, um, um, you know, they, they limit the, the wireless communication there. Um, because it's a medical building and you have radiations and things like that. Um, the vector magnitude was great for some of the physical workload. And then task density. So if you have the ability to understand what the task is and how much is being done at a time, you can do task density in real time, but you have to have a lot of knowledge of the task. So that's an advantage of our domains because we're talking about domains where you have a lot of training with the individuals. They're going to train with the robots just like they train with their human partners. So you have a good idea of the different types of tasks and what the densities could be so that you can develop a model of that, um, similar to some of the models that you guys have been trying to develop using machine learning. Now, the difficulty is when you talk to responders about these kinds of events, they will tell you that every event is different. So it's not, even though you've trained, you're modifying that task some. So how do you identify that? Um, and sometimes you're not going to be able to do that very well, so you're not going to have an excellent model of these things. So task density, even though it's green, um, could have some issues. And both, all of those, uh, sorry, not all of those, the heart rate variability and the task density, Regina, both go to cognitive. Um, and then the secondary task failure, this is what I was just talking about, creating a secondary task that you could, that's a natural task that's happening in the environment. So you can be looking at, um, did they correctly get the communication uh, directed at them? Did they do what they were supposed to do? So in our supervisory task experiment, in fact, um, they were receiving a number of communications. Some of them com communicated directly to them, and they were supposed to make a change to a radio. So you could verify through the system, did they go to the correct channel as your verification? Um, and then the in-situ workload ratings, these are orange because they work very well and they're very quick. So this is asking on those five factors of workload to rate your values from one to five, but it's subjective and it's not going to work in the real world. Um, so a lot of this is how do we get to, so she did not have in her studies um, the, the eye tracking, which is part of what we want. And as I said, she collected the speech data, and we started to code it, but it's not practical. So that's why we're moving towards getting these algorithms for the speech, OK? So right now, there's not a lot that you can actually use, Regina, uh, in, in real world situations. Um, now, if you have an environment, um, so we have a new project that just we just got the contract for last week that is going to be monitoring EMS personnel in an ambulance as they're treating patients on the way to the, to the hospital. And so we're going to be combining information about um, you know, wearable sensors that they're wearing. So it's not really the physiological. It's more of the, um, the IMU type of information. And then we're going to have cameras in the ambulance. What we're trying to do is to create a patient record that gets communicated from the ambulance automatically to the emergency room personnel, because that communication line often is a failure, and patients come in and the ER staff have no idea what kind of treatments they've received. And one of the students, I don't, it wasn't you, um, one of the students I talked to today actually used to be an EMS person, and so one of the things she told me that I can't wait to go back and tell the team that I didn't know because I, I hadn't actually looked at this yet, is that in the ambulance, it's very structured where everything is. So we were originally just talking about, in our proposal, creating information about what things were done on various parts of the body. But we can also look at what's happening in the ambulance and where they're taking certain supplies in order to get a better idea of what the treatment is in order to. So that isn't necessarily workload, 
but it's getting to what are the things that they're doing in a period of time and trying to identify um, some of those aspects. Because we're gonna assume, especially for a victim that um, has maybe a heart attack, that the, high, the workload is gonna be high, the cognitive workload is gonna be high. They've gotta be reacting in those situations, okay? Now you asked about modeling. Um, so I mentioned that we use the Imprint Pro. And what we do is we model all of our scenarios ahead of time. And with Imprint Pro, it has all those factors that I talked about in the beginning on my, over, my overall workload. Imprint, so all capital letters, Imprint, and then Pro, P-R-O. Um, and so this is the tool that I mentioned was, that was developed by the Army. Um, and basically, what they have a, com a common function of workload from the literature that's been known for these other domains. And you, when you go in and you try to set the factors as you're modeling your task, you're setting uh, a range based upon different criteria and the data that exists that they've collected over the last 20 years that they've built into the system to kind of help you develop your models. Uh, it came from ARL and AFO, uh, AFOSR and AFRL also contributed to it. So it started as man print and then it became imprint. Um, so yeah. And so we use that for developing our models. It gives you um, output for each of the different elements or components of workload as well as overall workload at every timestamp. And um, you can use that to see how it changes based on the task. You can add in, it's, so it's a, it's a discrete event type of system, so you can add in undecidability um, and different factors of that nature that can change how different things function if you've got uh, decision choice points. So, so uh, I think I skipped a few slides, so let me go back for one second. Okay, I did this slide. Uh, in the different studies, we use different um, things. So I mentioned wanting to use some of the off-the-shelf devices because this is the biopack. This particular device, when I bought it 10 years ago, was $5,000. I just bought the newest version, I bought two of them for $5,000. So it's a, it's a strap, it gives you the heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, skin temperature, it gives you the physical movements as well. Um, we also used a Loxy camera as kind of our, our um, focal point for eye tracking, trying to figure out where people were looking. Problem with that, of course, is that you've got to code it. Um, we, we can't do that in real time. And then we tried to use um, the Scosche Rhythm, which was the only device at the time Caroline did this work about four years ago that could give you uh, the individual heart rate variability data, but it, the update rate was slightly too slow to actually get something useful for that. And then we used the Fitbit to try to get some additional information. So the idea is can you bring all these different metrics together to get a better assessment of what the workload is? And like I said, we're not just interested in the cognitive, we're interested in all the other aspects as well. Um, okay. So going back to our original questions for Caroline's work, um, what we were able to determine was that in fact, we could use these existing models from the literature that they did apply to human robot teaming, um, which was really interesting. So we were less concerned about the human supervisory interaction where the robots are far away and the human's sitting at a computer. We were more concerned about this teaming where you might be closely or loosely coupled in a team working together. Um, and then we also were able to verify that we saw not only that our models um, had the, the expected trends, but that when we collected our data with the human-human and human-robot teams, that we saw similar, similar changes in the data. Um, so, we didn't, so what we saw was that these two, these two types of teams performed similarly, although the workload was a usually a little bit higher for the human-robot team because of just the standards of robots. They move slower, they talk slower, that kind of thing. Um, but we also saw that they, the two sets of data matched their respective models. Um, and so this was, this was a good insight as well. And then we also were working to try to identify what metrics were sensitive and reliable in this particular first response domain, and also try to identify what other metrics we could use. So as you saw from those couple of slides that I pulled up that had the red and the orange, you know, we have some cautionary tales about types of data. And we have to be, so Caroline's work was not necessarily looking at the task level. If you have task level information, then you can better use the, the individual metrics to identify 
is the heart rate going up because it's a cognitive load or is it going up because it's a physical load, right? And so you can better identify when you can use that data. So we want to be able to do that um, in our workload assessment algorithm and do that automatically. So this is where Jameson's work starts. Um, and as I mentioned, this project has been funded by DARPA NASA. So it's a supervisory type of task. And we've moved a little bit away from the peer-based task, but we'll come back to it in the data. And I'm going to go quickly, because what time did we start? 10 after? Yeah. OK. Um, so this is a high-level overview of his algorithm. Um, so you can see here, these are the metrics that we are using in the algorithm. And this is primarily because he was trying to match the metrics that was in Caroline's study so that we could have that uh, comparison. So you determine if there's an update. You apply that 30-second epoch. And the reason we use that 30-second epoch is because of the heart rate variability data. That is the, the metric that, that needs the, 30, the longest time signal. Um, so that's what we've used across everything else. We do some data imputation, and we do some filtering of that data. And then for each of the metrics, they have a neural net. And that neural net is designed differently depending upon how many different um, workload components they impact. So if it only impacts one workload component, it's a, a four-layer, one-node network. If it uh, impacts multiple metrics, and it's dependent upon the number of metrics. And then we also build in a factor. Um, you can see here the task composition. And even though this says activity recognition, this is where we want to go. Right now, we're using the models, those imprint models that I talked about. We feed those into the system, so that gives you a model of the workload for that particular task, and it gives you the tasks. So we know a priori what the tasks are. We want to move away from that. And that feeds into the neural network to give you a weighting of the factor um, when it goes, the weighting for that metric when it goes into the respective equation. OK? So I'll talk more about the equations in a moment. Once we have uh, the value for each of these, the estimated value for each of these, then we feed that into an overall workload. Um, and then we have estimates of the individual components as well as the workload, which in the long term we want to use to adapt either the interaction or the allocations of the tasks. So the workload equations for this particular work, uh, WC is cognitive, WP is physical, and uh, WA is auditory, and NL here is noise level. Um, noise level does correlate to workload, but it is insufficient for auditory workload, um, but that's what we were using at this point. Um, and so for the, for the cognitive, we're using the heart rate variability, HRV, the skin temperature, ST, the noise level, which also correlates to cognitive, sorry, um, heart rate. And then we have a, um, a beta value there, which is a, a factor kind of uh, looking at how much the cognitive uh, is playing into the equation. For the physical, we have posture, sway, pastor, magnitude, skin temperature, respiration rate, and heart rate. Now, with posture sway and posture magnitude, depending upon the task you're doing, you're not going to have a lot of that. Now, if I'm doing that first response triage task, I'm going to have much more posture sway and posture magnitude because I'm getting up, I'm going down, that kind of thing, as opposed to that supervisory task where I'm sitting in a control room like you're sitting in your chairs. You're not really moving around a lot. So we have to use um, a weighting uh, when we're determining these values with the neural nets that looks at the type of task we're doing and whether or not those factors are going to play an important role. And then because we don't have the speech and the visual, we're just using the imprint pro models for these values right now. Bless you. We take the respective values and just combine them into the overall. Um, so as I said, he did a study, a supervisory-based study. This is called Matt B. Um, it's from NASA. It's a simulator. Um, and basically, you have multiple tasks going on simultaneously that a remote pilot needs to do for a UAV. So one of the tasks is to monitor uh, these parameters here. If they're out of range, they have to make a change to them. If the green light becomes red, um, or if the, the red one is gray and then becomes red, they have to deal with that. They're trying to creep this target within the square area. They're also monitoring these fuel tanks and moving fuel around between the fuel tanks. If it's red, they have to deal with it. And then this is the communications task. So in the original MAP-B, they do not use an auditory task. We added it. 
Um, and so that's the task that I was talking about where you're communicating to them that they, there's a number of messages going on to different pilots and different aircraft. They have to listen for their tail number and then respond appropriately here. So all these tasks are kind of going on simultaneously. Again, we had, uh, for his study, the underload, the normal load, and the high workload. He's modeled these in Imprint Pro, um, so we have clear cutoffs that we can use. And so the slide here, um, assuming I had gone in my normal way that I had intended, um, was to just uh, reiterate that which uh, signals that we were using. So uh, we used, again, the bio-harness, bio-pack. Um, this was the original one that Caroline used. So um, we had the heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, um, posture sway. The noise level for his scenarios was actually simulated with this 50 decibel additive noise, which is pretty typical level of noise based upon the research in a um, control room type of situation. And then we use the NASA TLX and the in-situ ratings in these studies as kind of the baseline so that we can check whether or not the objective metrics are agreeing with the subjective metrics and such. Um, and so for his study, again, we used the Sure microphone and we used the BioPack, like I said. So the more interesting stuff here is how do we do the assessments? Because his algorithm is really designed to apply to different domains. So that first response domain and the supervisory domain. Now, it's all based on what your objective metrics are, right? Well, we use the same ones, so we can't apply this. Um, so I had an undergraduate student who did an REU with me this summer. And basically, her task was to take the data from Caroline's study and run it through his algorithm and then do the comparison with his results to her results. Um, so the questions we had for this is, can we take the algorithm and have it correctly classify workload? Um, at each of the component levels and the overall workload level. And then we want to know this. Obviously, we expect it to work if we train it for the peer evaluation, the first response evaluation. We expect it to work with the data from that evaluation. But what we want to see is that we can generalize across domains, right? That'd be really great if we could. So we wanted to train it with the supervisory data. And then we wanted to train it with data from both evaluations. Okay. Now, because there's different numbers of participants and there's different data points for each of the studies, we set it up so that the amount of data we were using for training was the same. The total number of data points is the same between the two evaluations, particularly when we bring them together in this situation where we're combining both of them. And then um, we want to know if the estimates for each of the individual components and the overall workload correlate to the workload models. Because our models, we believe, are correct. And so we want to make sure that we're getting this proper understanding. It's kind of like our baseline. And then as we go forward and we get something like a task recognition system, then we can integrate that and feel more comfortable of using that as opposed to the models. So for the peer-based data, what you see here is um, the classification accuracy. So we have, we're only looking cognitive and physical here because auditory only had noise levels, so that's really not that interesting. And then the other two were using the model, so they should match. Um, so we have the cognitive, physical, and the overall. Supervisory here is a supervisory data set from that study. Peer is from the first response, and then both is both. And we're looking at the peer-based relationships. So we see that we get, for low workload, 97% uh, accuracy and 94% accuracy, which is really high. We're pretty happy with that result. Um, but if we look at the supervisory, it, it's actually low or lower uh, for the low workload. And that's not too surprising given where the cutoffs were in her, her models and her data. Um, we do pretty well on the high workload condition. And of course, when we use both data sets together, we get some slight differences because you're really looking at these two things combined. So for this particular evaluation, this would be Caroline's third study. And we had, um, how many did she have? She had 36 participants, OK? And the data there was just the data from the human robot condition. So they, the subjects in that study did both the human-human condition, and then a few days later, did the, they either did the human-human or they did the human-robot, and then a few days later, they did the other condition. So she had 36 subjects. In his study, he had 24. 
Um, and they did actually two days, but this is, the, this is data only from the first day. And on the first day, they did all the workload conditions, um, and each condition was 15 minutes. So um, he has, he, basically, he took 70% of his data and 70% of her data, but then normalized it out to have the same number of data points bringing them together. Um, and then trained on the, re or tested on the remaining data. So this is the result of taking the trained system, the trained algorithms. So for um, each, for the algorithm, you end up with a supervisory trained one, a peer-based one, and, a, and an overall. And each algorithm is giving you each of these values, right? Because you're getting the components and you're getting the overall. So we get really nice results here on this. Um, any, I mean, we were going to be happy if we got above 80%. So to see these results, we were pretty excited. In fact, I made him go back and check it because I didn't really trust the undergraduates. Some of you talked about supervising undergrads today. Um, you know, and, and Anka, you were telling me that story as we were walking to lunch. You know, um, that, that was my fear of, you know, did you actually implement it correctly? <laughs> you know, so I mean, I, I actually said initially when the undergraduate came to meet with me, I'm like, these numbers are too high. Are you sure you did it right? You know, so um, we don't see as great results in the supervisory case. So UL here is under load, normal load, and overload. And I mean, we see great results, but we have zero here. Uh, for the peer-based only data. And that is because in Caroline's study, the high workload condition actually had a lower value in the workload range. So a value between zero and 100, her high workload in her condition was actually lower than the threshold in his condition for overload. So that's why we don't have anything for peer, but you can see we get very nice results here for the accuracy. The bigger question, becomes when we look at the model correlations and the estimated values. So here we've got the same thing. We've got our cognitive, physical, and overload. We've got our training, uh, the type of training that we had, and we have our workload conditions. So this top line here for each one is the model output. So this is the average and the low condition for the peer-based uh, scenario of what workload was. And then here's the high. Uh, for cognitive, and you can see for physical and for overall. Hold on, I, I'm a little confused. What is the scale of the workload? So the scale is what, 0 to 100. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, oh, actually, yeah, it's 0 to 100. It's been normalized from a smaller scale to 0 to 100. Um, and of course, the overall is a combination of not just these, but also the um, speech, the visual, and the auditory, right? So even though this is 14, these two values don't add up to 14 because you've got the other components coming out of the model that we're not looking at here. So what we see is we get really nice correlations for the peer estimates of workload to the model, right? So these look virtually identical, meaning Pearson correlation. Mm -hmm. So the Pearson correlation is looking at, do these two values statistically, is there a statistical difference between them or not? And are they positively correlated or negatively correlated? So you want a positive correlation. Um, and it's looking to see if there's really a significant difference between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different type of correlation, sorry. Um, and so we can see that we get really nice correlations for the peer and the both in many cases here. Um, the physical is great. Um, we see a little bit of overestimation here for um, the high. So what would be the highest correlation? What would be the number? High correlation. So high. It's very nice, but I still cannot. OK, so what it's looking at, Regina, is it's looking at is there really a significant difference between these two? OK. So it's really the difference. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, and so here we can see that this is a significant overestimate of high workload um, because that model has been trained differently because it's using the supervisory data as a higher level. So we get some nice results here 
in that all the Pearson correlations were significant um, for, for the peer and for the both data set. Um, and then, there we go, uh, for the supervisory data, we have a bit of a difference here. So you can see the peer is quite a bit different in many cases from the model. So it's the same setup as the other table. We have the model, and then we have the, the estimates that come out of the algorithm. Um, so for supervisory, again, we're getting very close to the models, which is great. Um, and this is why we see such high accuracies um, on, the, on the prior slides. So we're seeing that we get some underestimates for the supervise, or for the peer in this case, and overestimates for the supervisory when we're looking at the peer data. We sort of would expect this, but it's kind of a good news story because we're seeing some reasonable results out of doing this. So many of you have talked to about individual differences today. And we care about this because the individual differences are what's going to be an impact. So the, the key part of this particular result is looking across different domains and how well this works. If we look at the existing literature, a lot of people are getting significantly worse results than this. So we're getting a really nice result by looking at these things. Um, and then Jameson has additional data that he took on the second day of his study where we're going to actually be looking at changes for individuals over the course, but we haven't done that data analysis yet. Um, we'll also be able to use some of Caroline's data because we have um, the human-human data and we have the human-robot data for the participants across multiple days. So we'll be able to take some of that data as well and analyze the algorithm. But um, he hasn't had time to do that yet because I've been keeping him busy. Um, so we don't have significant correlations here um, for the underload and the overload in the cognitive or for the underload in the physical. Um, so that, that is a concern, but we'll have to figure out what's going on there. So going back to our questions, uh, we get really good results when it's trained on the same data. You kind of expect that, but the results were better than we anticipated. Um, this one's yellow because when it's trained on the non-teaming relationship, we see some really good results, but there's some things here and there that aren't quite good. Um, so we have to think about how we might weight that data differently in order to get a good result. And then when we train on both, we get a really nice uh, relationship uh, across the, the models and the data. And then here, I put this as a green star because our estimates of the values correlated really well in most cases. We had a couple of things that weren't really where we expected them to be. But in general, this is a really great result for this kind of study and this kind of um, algorithm. So this is a good news situation. Um, and uh, where Jameson hopes to be when he finishes his dissertation in two academic years is we'll have some basic activity recognition integrated into the system. So we'll no longer be using knowledge of every task that the participants are doing. Um, we're going to actually extend, we're actually doing work in another part of my lab on the distributed artificial intelligence to integrate the coalition formation with, or the, the coalition allocation, if you will, the task allocation with planning. So the coalition formation will just tell you who should be assigned based upon the mission criteria and the different capabilities of all the entities in the team. And we're trying to actually come up with plans. So we'll have extended this, and then we will have this interaction decision framework so that we're doing some ad adaptations. Will it be fully robust adaptations? I doubt it. Um, as most of you know, trying to do this kind of stuff, it takes a while to get the system to actually work the way you want it to. Annika's like, yeah. Um, and so when you work with real robots, it's always interesting, but um, we definitely, you know, one of the criteria for his dissertation is that he's got to show at least uh, a minimum level of adaptation by the robot to the conditions that are being seen. And then it will end up going on further to another student um, because, you know, you never get these things done unless you guys want to stay around your entire lives. Um, so this is where we're headed. And, um, you know, really, this is still my driving application. This is what we're always thinking about when we're trying to find sensors that we can use. Because this is a really difficult environment to try to monitor these things. Um, you know, I was talking to some of you, and the iPhone is the thing that's really changed robotics in my mind over the last 10 years. Um, you know, the miniaturization of the computer chips, the miniaturizations of the sensors, 
all these things are really giving us more capabilities. And that's also translating to wearable sensors. So I keep hoping that we're going to end up with an eye tracking system that is reliable enough to work in real world environments. Um, I keep hoping that we're going to get some sensors like small wrist-based, or I'm um, sorry, not wrist-based, but arm-based sensors like the, the Skosh that will give us really high fidelity uh, signals that we can process to get this information because this is much more bearable in that personal protective gear than wearing a chest strap that can move around on you. Um, so it's all these interesting signal problems that, that you have to deal with. And you guys are dealing with them as well and coming up with the control algorithms. So we're not necessarily trying to derive control algorithms for this stuff. That's part of the Swarm's work. Here we're really trying to derive changes in the human workload and be able to adapt the system to help the human. And so that's that. Um, the underlines are funding sources that have funded this work. The underlines of the students are people who've worked on it. Um, if you've ever done uh, human subject studies, you know that as a student, you can't do them all by yourself. So Caroline had lots of help over the time um, with various students. And um, Jameson basically did his study on his own because it was a supervisory study. But if you have robots moving around in a real world environment, like we did for her work, um, you've got to have security monitors. And we were placing like fake pipe bombs in the environment and stuff. So he looks at me like, what? Yeah. Um, we had the former Metro Bomb Squad chief as uh, special forces on the Vanderbilt PD, and he was my buddy. So I, I made fake pipe bombs that he trained me how to make, and we put them in places. In fact, I have a picture. I skipped that slide because I got deterred. Um, where is it? Oops, right there. So this is one of our fake pipe bombs. It was under the eyewash station. <laughs> And um, we, you know, basically we went around doing things and I, you know, because of the IRB and the police department, I had to walk around with them and show them. And he, he looked at me, he's like, um, can I bring my guys over here and train them? Because I've trained you very well and where you've put these things, my guys would not find them. So he actually brought his officers over and gave them the task of finding all the things that I had put in the environment for the participants. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're a bit over time, but I think we do have time for a couple of I'm going to kind of stand away from you so do, we don't squeal. Oh, yeah, so we don't squeal. Um, yeah, well, I'll be passing this off to anybody who asks the question. Um, I mean, I okay, could start. I had a question. I, I had a question, actually. So, I mean, I think you've talked about a lot of really interesting uh, metrics here that are translating to this like overload, underload conditions. I'm curious because I've, I don't know, as a as a person who's participated in some HRI studies, I filled out a lot of Likert scales. Yes. Um, and I feel like do you, I don't know, you're basically just sort of distinguishing between different states here, but do you think any of these sort of metrics would translate to maybe slightly lower cognitive tasks, whether you could get the same kind of resolution that you would need to be not replacing, but but augmenting those kinds of metrics for like. You HRI mean studies. augmenting the the Likert scale? Um, yeah, because I mean, it, it seems like a lot of HRI studies rely on this, you know, human subjective. Subjective. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we are very much trying to move away from the subjective data. Um, the in situ workload questions were questions that we came up with in Caroline's work, and we actually asked those while they're doing the tasks to try to get a good metric. Because the NASA TLX is very, if you've ever used it, it's very, um, in, it, it's very long. And it takes a long time to do properly. And so we wanted something that was quick and fast. Um, so we do use that. But we use it more as a, a, a truth, a ground truth, if you will. But it's not really ground truth because it's subjective, right? But it does give us the ability to look at our objective metrics correlating with the subjective metrics, especially with the modeling stuff with Caroline's work, you know, we had no idea if these models were going to be accurate when we built them. Yes, they were based on these functions that are well studied in other domains, but we didn't know if what was coming out of them was going to match what we actually saw. And her work was the first work that we had done with all these physiological metrics. And even though there's all this stuff in the literature, you're not really sure is it going to work. So, you know, we prefer to err on the side of collecting that data, but I don't think you can use the subjective data in real time. 
if you're trying to do something. Right. So I was curious whether sort of on the flip side, you know, some of the metrics that you guys are coming up with have sort of the resolution to handle maybe lower cognitive tasks, like just, you know, interacting with a robot in a more canonical, you know, robots handing you things yeah. type um, HRI scenario. Heart rate variability would be difficult to see a lot of change um, because you do need a long period of time for that. So with heart rate variability, you have to put the device on the person. You usually give them five to 10 minutes to get their baseline. Um, so it depends on the task that you're doing. So for example, Nalanj and Sarkar and uh, Pramila, and I cannot think of Pramila's last name. She graduated quite a few years ago. They were actually using uh, heart rate variability, for example, an EEG with um, autistic patients um, playing basically a basketball game. So they had a basketball hoop on a manipulator, and the, student, the participants were trying to throw the ball, and they would change the speed and the position. So they were able to get that. But they were using um, you know, a system that has a big box associated with it and big sensors. So the bioharness does a really good job right now, um, but I think a lot of the other sensors don't have the resolution we need, and that's where we need to go, is we need to get to that level where these off-the-shelf devices really have that resolution. So yeah, I mean, I, I think- Still be dealing with Likert scales for a while. <laughs> you're gonna be dealing with Likert scales for a little while, yeah. But there's other ways, right? I mean, I'm hoping, like the speech-based metrics are really promising if we can get those algorithms to work properly. Um, they, they are really, really, in my mind, one of the best ways, at least for my work to go forward, that may not work in a low-level manipulation type of task. Thanks. So, Anka. I have a comment to Laura first, which is actually that I think, I don't think we're going to get rid of Likert scales, even if we have no. good objective I mean, metrics. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I like to look at them as supplements to the yeah. Um, objective data, and I also like to look at them as kind of a verification of the objective data. Yeah, and sometimes they actually contradict the objective data, yes. which is really interesting, right? Because then you have some interesting finding about, well, okay, technically this stuff is better, but people hate it, so yeah. what do we like, do? We, we do care, right, that yeah. people like the robot. <laughs> that's also an important Yeah, thing. and that's actually where, like, our in situ ratings, you actually see things, like, with NASA TLX, you'll often see frustration really high when working with robots. And you can see that sometimes in the in situ ratings that are looking across the different variables as well. So, so I had a, not really a question but a comment, but I'd love to maybe team up with you on s figuring out how to estimate cognitive workload based on the kind of physical movement, mm -hmm. right? So the way the person is doing the task yeah. tells you. We haven't if looked at that at all. Yeah, I think that'd be really cool. I yeah. like looking at the actual we need to motion that. that people are doing. And I think it, yeah, I think it conveys a bunch of information. Yeah. We have not movement. thought about that at all. In fact, I was having a conversation with somebody this afternoon, and I don't remember because there were people coming in who were not on my list. It might have been, was it you two? No, you two didn't come in together. You came in with somebody else. Was it you that we were talking about physical movements and being able to detect different things? Um, yeah, we were talking about force feedback and control. Yeah, I don't remember if it was you or not. Sorry. <laughs> was it you? I don't remember. You were this afternoon, too. I'm so confused. There's so many people. Um, but we were semi having that kind of conversation this afternoon about how do you use some of the physical aspects. And I think it's easier if you know what the task is. Yes. But the question is, can you get that task recognition going as well? And, and it depends on your domain, too. But I think that fundamental question hasn't been answered yet. So we need to talk. Yeah, so changing context a little bit, um, I think another... Um, sort of more subtle type of human robot teams where this whole issue of workload and uh, vigilance becomes incredibly important is um, safety critical systems uh, in which humans are in partial control, mm -hmm. uh, such as airplanes yep. or I guess now semi-autonomous cars, um, and in which it would be extremely important for the automation to be aware of just how um, attentive and how capable of responding the human is. And so I was wondering if, uh, if you had any thoughts of how some of these algorithms can We actually wrote a proposal about safety. that that did not get funded okay. oh, <laughs> by sorry. the NSF. Um, so for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Join the club. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, come on. She's got more rejected proposals than me, believe me, because she's been doing it longer. <laughs> but um, we actually, so that was the premise of a proposal that we wrote uh, probably about four years ago to CPS that was, um, because uh, I have this picture that you guys saw earlier. I love this picture because it really uh, shows my fear of what is going to happen and exactly what I predict will happen and did happen, by the way, in the Tesla accidents. Yes. So the premise of this video is that, or this picture, is that she is in an autonomous car. And she's in a peloton of autonomous Volvos. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you can see Volvo trucks and Volvo cars, and she's totally engrossed in her magazine. And this is, in theory, on the Autobahn. Need I say more? Uh, mm -hmm. One little thing goes wrong. The crash has happened. She has no idea what, by the time she has even figured out that the crash has happened, it's over. She can't respond. So right. it's out of the loop. Yeah, right? and that's even true even if she's um, trying attention. to pay attention yeah. and trying to keep her hands on the wheel, her yes. eyes on the road. Yes. You can't just tell a human, hey, just pay attention for the next two hours. So this has become so. a more critical issue. And, and so with, with pilots, they have other incentives. And those incentives are they're going to lose their pilot's license mm -hmm. if they are not paying attention. So those Delta pilots that missed landing in Minneapolis a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. they had some big questions to answer um, because they were asleep. They were not paying attention, and they missed their airplane. They missed their airport. You didn't hear this? Yeah, yeah. they did. Um, so this becomes so with pilots. There's this incentive, right? With us as drivers, I don't think it was you that I was saying this to. I think it was you guys that I was saying this, that you know, pilots have to have training every year yeah. on these safety critical issues. Can you imagine when we have autonomous vehicles, assuming that we don't go with the Uber model and we don't own our own cars, is the DMV going to require all of us to go in for two days worth of training on off nominal events and certify that we are allowed to drive our car, right? They're not. They can't even handle us getting driver's licenses now. Right. There's too many people, right? Yeah. So this is a real big issue. And how do you do that identification? So we were actually looking at what kinds of sensors could you put in the vehicle to try to detect. Are people lying back and sleeping? Are, you know, what is the pressure sensors? We have those already to turn on and off airbags in the car, right? Um, are they reading something? Are they totally engrossed in a conversation? Like, could you listen to things going on in the car and derive what they were doing and make some projections? And then how would you be able to alert them to bring them back into the loop? Right. Um, these are big questions that we don't really know the answers for here because this is a less constrained environment than cockpits and nuclear power plants. Right. And it's, it's got some incredibly hard challenges, like if you're a pilot and something goes wrong and you get distracted for a second, you can, you've can you got you know a couple of minutes to figure out what to do, whereas if you're in a there car, you don't. you've got in the order of fractions of a second. Yeah, right? you don't. And, and we've already, I mean, there's numerous accidents, automobile accidents every day in this country where you can see that you don't, even when you are supposed to be paying attention, we're distracted by our phones or we're distracted by something else. You know, and in fact, Oregon, um, as of yesterday, if you're holding your phone in your car while you're driving, you get a $250 fine. Right. The second time, it's a $1,000 fine. And the third time, you lose your license. That started on the 1st of October. So I think we're going to see those kinds of things happening, the laws changing, um, in order to try to mitigate some of these things. And then I was having a conversation, I think it was with you two earlier, about um, you know if we go with the Uber model and there is no steering wheel, and the Uber car is coming to pick you up every day and drive you to work, you know, what if something goes wrong? You have no ability of interacting with that car and controlling that car, right? Well, the idea is you're only going to have such a car once that is a saved product, right? Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think? You've been doing robotics longer than me. Will they be perfect? No comment. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, I just read today on the on from UK news about uh, this um, Sebastian Throne who is pushing flying cars. 
<laughs> no, yeah, some people are doing that now because they're fun. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I mean, all the regulations say to me, talk about on the road, and we still... We can't even deal with UAVs, right. you know, and the policies for those, let alone flying cars. I, I was, you know, in this community of HRI, kind of people often talk about intent. <laughs> okay, and, and in the AI, explainable AI world, and, yes. And it bothers the hell out of me because, I, I'm sorry, to this way. <laughs> That is the issue. Huh? Well, you observe it after the fact. Yes, exactly. Like once the person has done it, you can figure out what you want it to do. Well, right? but I mean, and the whole goal is to try to figure it out ahead of time. Right? But mm -hmm. that's why you get a bunch of data, and then you make predictive models of what the intent is going to be. Yes. But and then you know. But, but that's assumed. That but that uh, works in environments where you can get the training data, right? Not only that, guys, but it assumes that I am consistent. And that what I did, you know, yesterday I will do today, you know. Mm -hmm. And as we know, people are not always consistent. That's right. right. So, you right. know, I mean, almost you assume that we, we became robotized. You know, <laughs> coming back to my roots, you know, which was this you are, are you are, you know. And, and, I mean, it was actually a reaction to the Nazis soldiers, you know, who were saluting and marching like little robots. I mean, that's where the yeah. old RUR came from. But in any case, so, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned when people tell me that they can do Infer intent, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's something to be said, I think, and I think Anka was sort of mentioning it, which is predictive models have the ability not only to tell you what they think the human is likely going to do, but rather how sure I am that the person is going to do this. So there are cases in which you really have very good data predictors that tell, that tell you know, the person's gaze has suddenly turned in that way. Uh, they have started some sort of, say, muscle movement that somehow you're able to detect. And then you're really sure that they're going to, you know, go in and do a lane change. And they're going to try and do that. They show you data that it doesn't work. Right, right. So, that, so the key is that, so the key is that in, some cases you'll, in some cases you'll have you'll have a lot of certainty, and in some, you won't have a lot of certainty. And as long as you're able to reason about that, then I would argue that you're better off than just saying, I can't say anything about what the person's going to do. Because if you have no clue what the person's going to do, they might as well you know, shut down the business. I'm saying that. That's why I was interested in this cognitive part. How can she measure the cognitive part? Well, we're not measuring intent. That's for yes. sure. Yeah. <laughs> because from some physical behavior, you can hypothesize, and that was the intent. If I do this, you can hypothesize, well, she's give, you know, pushing, pushing the, the book to him. Fine. You know, th those are observables yes. that you can kind of stand on and see what I'm saying. You're not getting the neurological level, is what I think you're pointing at. Is and even psychological levels. So that's yeah. Where that's where the BCI comes in, right? The brain computer interface. Yeah. Aren't there people here who do that? Uh, there it's all are. magic. Well, not in the room, I guess. Yeah. yeah, Jose's here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, maybe I'm showing my old age or whatever the conservatism, but you know, engineers should stand on the ground. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're well over time. Thank our speaker. <laughs>